Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today's topic is this month's patron pick, state-based actions. I actually suggested this topic myself after it came to my attention that somehow I had never done a long-form video on this subject. A lot of the time, these patron picks kind of tend to stretch my comfort zone, but not today. And it kind of does feel nice every now and then to have something that fits well within your wheelhouse, just as a little bit of a comfort pick. And so let's take a look at how state-based actions work. So a lot of the time, I feel like most people, um, you know, or at least a lot of people, when they hear the term state-based action, they think maybe that's, you know, something that they heard a judge say once, uh, and it doesn't really have a lot of meaning for them. So I'm going to start from the, the literal ground and, and build my way up. So basically the idea is that every, every state-based action has a condition and an action. And at specific times throughout the game, and we'll talk more uh, about what that would be uh, it, later on in the presentation, but at specific times, the game is going to check to see if any of the conditions for any of the state-based actions exist in the game state. And if so, the game performs the action uh, in order to fix that condition. And so basically, uh, the, the state in game state and state-based action is the same. Uh, so that's, that's the idea, is that the state-based actions exist to, to try to fix things in the game state. Um, and, and again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what, what types of things, uh, well, I guess now. All right, so these are all the state-based actions. Um, actually, I lied. Uh, there's, there's also these. Uh, and then on top of that, there's, there's some, there's some state-based actions that are actually specific to uh, certain game types. Uh, so, so there's these also. And if, if someone gave me a pen and a piece of paper and they said, Judge Dave, we need you to write down all the state-based actions, I don't think I could do it. Um, you know, maybe if I had infinite time and it was like a million dollars per state-based action that I could do, I could come up with probably most of them, but I, I don't even know if I could write all of them down. And this is me saying that, uh, as someone with pretty high level rules knowledge, right after making a presentation on state-based actions. Uh, so with that being the case, you can kind of infer what the, uh, importance level that I think should be placed on trying to memorize all of them. Now, if you're the kind of person where, uh, you would be normally interested in doing something like that, hey, go wild, uh, do, do what makes you happy. Uh, but if, if you're the sort of person who does not like memorizing all the state-based actions, uh, you know, as a, as a concept, uh, certainly uh, that's okay. Uh, so what I think is more important would be if you uh, understood what kinds of things were state-based actions and then were, were familiar with the most common ones. So I'm, I'm going to go through uh, uh, a, a few groups now so that people can kind of get an idea what I'm talking about. So the first group that I'm going to talk about is losing the game. And basically anytime you're going to lose the game uh, and it's not because like some card specifically says you're losing the game like a door to nothingness kind of a thing, um, that probably means that there's a state-based action making you lose the game. Uh, and so this is like all the, the ones that we're kind of familiar with. So if a player has zero or less life, they lose the game. Uh, the one with decking, uh, the next one is, is uh, the one that causes you to lose if you get decked. And a lot of people think that uh, just having an empty library is what makes you lose the game. But as you can see um, in the, the actual text of the rule, you actually don't lose from having an empty library. What you lose from is if you try to draw a card from an empty library uh, since the last time state-based actions were checked. Um, and then you've got uh, the, the next one there uh, is, is referring to the poison counters. So if you have 10 or more poison counters. Um, and you, you can see, uh, ignore this rule in two-headed giant games. So actually like three of those uh, rules from the last slide uh, that, that came up only in certain formats, uh, certain alternate formats, uh, that, that two, two of them are for two-headed giant giving you uh, 15 poison counters and uh, having teams instead of players that reach zero life. Um, and one of them is commander. So you've got the, the commander damage making you lose the game. That, that also is a state-based action. Um, so yeah, all, all of those different ways to lose the game uh, would, would be uh, a state-based action. So next, uh, we've got cleaning up is, is what I'll call this. Uh, and so basically these all relate to stuff uh, that has been used up in the game uh, being taken care of and getting cleaned up. So if, if you have a token that's in a zone other than the battlefield, if you have a copy of a spell in a zone other than the stack, uh, or a copy of a card in any zone other than the stack or the battlefield, uh, if you have a, a saga that has too many lore counters on it, and uh, this is the last one is the uh, the new new kid on the block here. Uh, if, if a player's venture marker on the last room of a dungeon, 
um, then then the dungeon uh, gets gets removed from the game. Um, so that that's kind of interesting that it, it uses the term removes it from the game uh, rather than exiles it um, or like it vanishes and ceases to exist. Um, I'm not really sure what the the rationing behind that templating is, but yep, there you go. So th those four are also examples of state based actions. Uh, then we have uh, killing creatures and planeswalkers is this next batch. So there's actually three different state-based actions that relate to killing creatures. Uh, so if you have a toughness of zero or less, it's put into its owner's graveyard. Regeneration cannot replace this event because we're not destroying the creature. And that's what regeneration looks for, is it looks for you to destroy uh, the creature. Um, obviously, zero toughness or less, we can't make that be destroy because like, if an indestructible creature had zero or less toughness... Um, well, it wouldn't be able to get destroyed, uh, but we still would have zero or less toughness the next time uh, we checked. So, it, you know, we, it, it would stick around in that case. So that's, that's uh, I think, one of the reasons why it's, it's worded like that. Um, if a creature has lethal damage on it, uh, then it does get destroyed. Um, that is uh, how, how that state-based action works. And so because we are actually destroying a permanent and destroying is what regeneration looks for, uh, regeneration can replace this effect. And uh, if, if a tough creature has uh, uh, taken any amount of damage from a creature or other source with death touch, then that creature also gets destroyed. And so therefore, uh, because we're getting destroyed, regeneration can replace this event. You can uh, kind of tell that people got really confused about how regenerate works. Uh, because they had to put in the, the comprehensive rules for something completely different, uh, what sorts of stuff it works against and what sorts of stuff it doesn't. And uh, finally, if a Planeswalker has zero loyalty, it, it gets put into its own graveyard. So um, I went ahead and grouped this together with the, the Killing Creatures ones, because it's kind of analogous to this top one here where the creature has zero uh, toughness. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe someone might think that that really it should fit in with uh, this this one here. So the, the legend rule uh, is if, if a player controls two or more legendary permanents with the same name, um, then they choose one and the rest get put into their owner's graveyards. So this is actually called the legend rule, uh, which is the reason why Mirror Gallery um, and the, the new one that they just printed in Neon Dynasty, that's the reason why cards like that can actually specifically say the legend rule doesn't apply. Uh, and there is a specific rule in the comprehensive rules that says it is the legend rule. And so that's, that's the reason why those uh, cards are able to use that kind of colloquialism uh, in order to refer to that rule. So that's kind of a cool uh, uh, bit of trivia for you. And then it used to be that Planeswalkers had their own, you know, basically a legend rule, but only for Planeswalkers. And it was called the Planeswalker Uniqueness Rule. And again, it had that same like line in there that said, this is called the Planeswalker Uniqueness Rule. Uh, but of course they don't have that anymore. All the Planeswalkers are legendary now, so it's not needed. Um, and then you might not have heard about this this one. This uh, uh, this next one is kind of like in the in the running for like the most obscure state-based action. And you, you can uh, vote in the comments which one you think the most obscure state-based action is. Um, but this one I think should definitely be in the running for it, which is the world rule. Um, and so that that's like if two or more permanents have the super type world, uh, all except for the, the one that's been a world for the shortest amount of time. Uh, so it's kind of like the opposite of how the legend rule used to work. Um, so all, all of, all of the uh, uh, worlds get put into the graveyard if there is a tie for the shortest amount of time, which is also kind of like, uh, you know, the opposite of, of how the legend rule used to work in some sense. So this is called the world, world rule. If you've never seen a world enchantment before, this is what they look like. Um, nowadays, uh, they would be templated like this. They actually say world enchantment on them. Uh, but if you see any of them that have been printed in paper uh, magic, it will say enchant world. Um, and as you can see, they, they come from ye oldy days in magic history. Uh, the world rule actually does come up, or at least it, you know, hypothetically could come up, because a, a handful of these world enchantment cards uh, did see some play in Legacy. The Abyss is one of them. Um, and so the idea uh, is that if you have a Concordant Crossroads, you could use that as a one-mana removal spell for the Abyss, uh, which, which is kind of cool. Uh, and maybe, maybe it would be even more cool to think that like, if you played the Abyss while there was a Concordant Crossroads out, uh, then you would be able to... Uh, like use the Abyss as a removal spell against Concordant Crossroads, which of course Black doesn't generally uh, have any mechanism to get rid of enchantments. And so, um, you know, that that's kind of cool. But yeah, that's that's the world rule and that's how that worked. Um, 
not not a, a super big player in the the state based action rule nowadays, but uh, you know it, it is kind of a cool part of Magic's history. And now you now you know what it means when it says Enchant World. It's not just like ye oldie days mono artifacts and uh, you know stuff like that. It it actually does have a rules meaning. Uh, so okay, next block of uh, state based actions. I'm gonna call that uh, fixing bad attachments. Uh, so this is all to do with uh, when something is attached to a permanent that it's not supposed to be. So if an aura is attached to an illegal object or not attached to any object uh, or player, then it gets put into its owner's graveyard. If an equipment or fortification is attached to an illegal permanent, it becomes unattached, but in this case it stays in play, it doesn't go to its owner's graveyard. Um, and then if a creature is attached to an object or player, it becomes unattached uh, and stays on the battlefield. And similarly, if a permanent that's neither an aura, an equipment, or a fortification is attached, then it becomes unattached and remains on the battlefield. And at first, at first glance, it might seem like they're basically saying the same thing twice here, um, but uh, it, it actually is not. The, the difference is that it's possible for a creature to be uh, um, attached to something, uh, or it's possible for a creature to be an equipment, aura, or fortification and be attached to something. Um, so in that case, the first sentence would apply to that creature uh, being attached to that object, but the second sentence would not. Um, so we actually, uh, there is a slight logistic, or a slight logical difference in between those two statements there. Um, and of course, uh, with the reconfigure cards that they just printed, uh, that's, that's one reason why uh, those cards all stop being creatures once they are attached to a permanent. Um, because otherwise, this state-based action would make them fall off, because... Uh, if they stayed being creatures, then the, the first sentence of this would apply to them, and therefore they would fall off as a result of this state-based action. So because of this rule here, that's the reason why uh, reconfigure cards stop being creatures once they become attached to something. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's a little insight for you there. Uh, the next one uh, is, is kind of similar as fixing counters. So if a permanent has a plus one and a minus one counter on it, uh, then it removes n of them, where that is the number that it would take to make it so it no longer has both a plus and a minus counter on it. Uh, this rule came about in Shadowmoor block. Um, Shadowmoor, if you remember, has a uh, big minus one, minus one counters matter sub-theme, and Wizards was afraid that people would get confused because there were plus one counters and minus one counters, and... and uh, most people don't have two different kinds of dice to, to distinguish those sorts of things. And so someone came up with the idea, okay, we'll just make it so that it's not possible for a creature to have plus one counters and minus one counters on it. So that was the, the solution they came up with. Um, and then there's this, this rule here. So if a permanent with an ability that says it can't have more than n counters of a certain kind on it has more than n counters on it, uh, then all but n of them are removed. So this this rule here is uh, also probably my uh, pick for the most obscure state-based action. Uh, as far as I know, it applies to only one card in Magic's history. Um, so that is the uh, the Rasputin Dreamweaver. And as, as far as I know, that puts Rasputin into that honored club of Magic cards that have their own rule and the comprehensive rules that describes how they work. So that's that's kind of cool. Uh, next next set of them is uh, the, the rest. So this is uh, a couple of state-based actions that are uh, specific to alternate formats. So you got one for Arch Enemy and one for Plane Chase. I'm going to be honest with you. I've never played or even seen somebody playing uh, either of these formats as far as I'm aware. Um, and so as a result, I don't really know a whole lot about these two state-based actions. Um, and then the, the last one is uh, also uh, an alternate format specific state-based action, uh, but this one actually does come up uh, a fair amount. So in, in a commander game, uh, the, the commander being in the graveyard or in exile, uh, the, this is the rule that lets you put it into the command zone. Uh, so I actually did make a video fairly recently uh, that, that talked about this being a state-based action and some of the consequences uh, of this being a state-based action. So I won't touch on it too terribly here. You can check that video out if you're uh, interested in that. Um, but now, now let's uh, talk a little bit about how they actually function. And so this is the actual rule uh, that, that specifically says exactly all the stuff uh, about how state-based actions function. And unlike uh, all those previous slides where I talked about like 
you know, this is this is what all the state-based actions are. This rule, it actually is, you know, even though it's a lot of text, it's actually all important. Um, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna actually go through, uh, you know, line by line, and then we'll talk about each specific line uh, with with like some examples or some some extra commentary here. So uh, whenever a player would get priority, the game checks for any of the listed conditions for state-based actions. And we talked about what all the different state-based actions were just now. Um, so whenever a player gets priority is kind of like an important phrase to, to pay attention to here. And that, I'd say like probably a good like 70-ish percent of state-based action questions uh, come down to this this line here. Uh, like if, if we're talking about like real questions that I got in a real tournament. Um, so state-based actions only get checked at specific times. And that, that is kind of unusual. Uh, like for example, if you're talking about like triggered ability, uh, if a triggered ability sees the game state at any time matching the trigger condition, it will trigger. Uh, and even if the game state is completely different by the time that trigger actually gets to go on the stack, once it triggered, it's, it's good. Uh, state-based actions do not work like that. State-based actions only care about what the game state looks like at certain specific predefined times. And again, we'll talk about those more um, a little bit later here. Um, so here, here's kind of an example of that. And this this is, you know, one of the... the judge vault state-based action questions, right? Um, very, very famous question. Uh, if, if you have, the idea being like, we, we have a, a Tarmogoyf and, and right now there's like lands and creatures, say, uh, in, in graveyards. So the, the Tarmogoyf would be a two, three, and then we're gonna play a lightning bolt targeting the Tarmogoyf. Uh, what happens? And so based on what we just talked about, uh, the state-based actions do not happen until a player is about to get priority. Now, that's kind of interesting because when the Lightning Bolt deals the three damage to the Tarmogoyf, the Tarmogoyf's not gonna die right away, right? Because that state-based actions are what causes lethally damaged creatures to be put into their owner's graveyard. Okay, so with that being the case, when we Lightning Bolt the Tarmogoyf, what's actually gonna happen is the Lightning Bolt puts three damage on the Tarmogoyf. And then, because the Lightning Bolt has done all of its instructions, it's gonna get put into the graveyard. And then a player is about to get priority. So that means that Tarmogoyf is going to be checked for state-based actions at that time because a player is about to get priority. And at that time, the Lightning Bolt is in the player's graveyard. And so what that means is that Tarmogoyf will be a 3-4 and it will not have lethal damage on it. And so that is, uh, you know, again, like right out of the Judge Vault, very famous um, state-based action kind of a question. Uh, but that, that kind of like illustrates the importance of that, that whenever a player would get priority. And that, that illustrates the reason why that line is important there. Uh, similarly, if you were to Lightning Bolt a Dryad Militant, uh, the Lightning Bolt would get exiled. And the reason for that is because, uh, remember again what the sequence of actions is going to be. First, the Lightning Bolt is going to deal three damage to the Dryad Militant. Then, the game is going to want to put Lightning Bolt into its owner's graveyard. Except it can't because Lightning Bolt uh, is an instant or sorcery card and it would be uh, getting exiled instead of being put into the graveyard. Because again, the Dried Militant has not yet left the battlefield because we don't do state-based actions until a player is about to get priority. And the player doesn't get priority until after Lightning Bolt has finished all of the steps of its resolution, including the part where you put it into its owner's graveyard. So contrast that with a Doomblade. So if we were to Doomblade the Dryad Militant, then the Doomblade just says to destroy it. We're not dealing damage to it, we're, we're just destroying it. So the, the action of destroying the Dryad Militant happens during the resolution of the Doomblade, like while the Doomblade is resolving. And so what that means is that the Dryad Militant is going to be in the graveyard and therefore not on the battlefield trying to affect what zone the Doomblade goes to at the time when the game is trying to put the Doomblade into its owner's graveyard. So unlike with the Lightning Bolt, the Doom Blade actually does get to go to its owner's graveyard because it does uh, kill the Dryad Militant during part of its resolution, and that happens before the, the part where the, the Doom Blade would be getting put into its owner's graveyard. So the, those are like some kind of examples that, that showcase the difference um, where uh, what we talked about before, where, where the priority uh, getting checked is the, the you know, thing that tells the game to check state-based actions. So, okay, after checking to see if any state-based actions apply, 
the game performs all the applicable state-based actions simultaneously as a single event. So this is another thing that's kind of unusual with state-based actions. Uh, it's, it's rather odd for anything in a game of Magic to happen simultaneously. Um, a, a lot of the time, you would expect things to happen multiple, you know, at, at multiple uh, instances. Uh, however, the, the way that the state-based actions actually work is, you know, the game will go through the list of all the different state-based actions, um, and then it'll say, okay, does any of these conditions exist? And every time it sees one of those conditions that exists, it's going to, like, write it down, like maybe on, on the fairy whiteboard that they use to keep track of triggered abilities, since they're not using it at this time. Um... So the, they'll write down all of the state-based actions that they want to do. And then afterwards, we do all of the stuff that we wrote down in one single game event. And so uh, here, here's kind of an example to help everybody uh, understand exactly why that might be. So we're going to play a Pyroclasm and there's a, a Death Greeter out, right? So there, there's a Death Greeter and, and maybe, um, you know, some other creatures in play that are going to die to this Pyroclasm. So what do you think? Do you get to gain one life off of uh, all the other creatures or some of the other creatures or maybe not? Maybe you don't get to gain one life from any of the creatures. And so this, this gives a little bit of an intuition for why uh, the, the state-based actions all get performed simultaneously. Uh, if they got performed in some sort of an order, we would have to know what the order was that the all of the creatures that were dying due to Pyroclasm died. Uh, and then whether where the Death Greeter was in that order would affect what creatures uh, the Death Greeter would get a trigger off of. Um, of course, based on what we were just talking about, that's not how it works. Uh, the, the Pyroclasm does two damage to everything, and then the game is going to check all of the creatures to see if they have lethal damage on them. And it's going to write down, you know, this creature gets to get destroyed, this creature is getting destroyed, this creature is getting destroyed, and then it destroys all of them in one game action. So actually the Death Greeter uh, is going to, uh, you know, be put into the graveyard at the exact same time uh, as, as all those other ones. So we don't have to try to, like, figure out which which creatures are, like, before it in, in the order and which creatures are after it in the order, um, you know, because the, the, it, it all happens all at the same time. Um, so you would, in fact, get the the triggers from all of the creatures that got destroyed at the same time as Death Greeter. Okay, uh, another another uh, line here. If any state-based actions are performed as the result of a check, this check is repeated. So basically what this is saying is, okay, we, we check to see if there's any state-based actions that apply, right? And if there were, the game does those state-based actions. And if any state-based actions are performed at that time, then we check again to see if there's any state-based actions that need to be performed. All right, so if you're wondering why this is and what the significance of it is, here's an example that might help you out. So uh, we've got the, the Pyroclasm and the Elvish Champion and the Cillian Elf, which for the purposes of this question, it's going to be important for you to be able to see that the Cillian Elf is actually a 2-2. Two -two. Uh, so it's like a Grizzly Bears, except it's an Elf. And that means that the Elvish Champion is, is going to be buffing the Cillian Elf. Right, so what we've got is we've got the Pyroclasm and it's going to deal 2 damage to Elvish Champion, 2 damage to Cillian Elf. And so that means that we've got a 2-2 two -two with 2 damage on it and a 3-3 three -three with 2 damage on it. And so we're going to perform state-based actions, and that means that the Elvish Champion is going away, right? Because it's 2-2 two -two with 2 damage on it. Other, other elves, so it does not affect itself. Uh, then, after the state-based actions have been performed, like what we talked about just now, we're going to check to see if there's any more state-based actions that need to be applied. And now there is. Uh, because now we have Cillian Elf, which is a 2-2 two -two now because it's not getting buffed by Elvish Champion anymore. And so the Cillian Elf will, will also uh, be destroyed as well. So that is, you know, kind of the rationale behind that uh, is, is that we, we want to make sure that after we perform state-based actions, that doesn't cause a game state to develop that has some more state-based actions that we need to do. Um, I had another video uh, a while ago where I talked about uh, Platinum Angel plus Expansion Explosion. And that, that was another really great example that I liked uh, about this aspect of state-based action. So you can check that out if you're uh, interested in uh, another example. Um, but 
for for now we'll we'll go on to the uh, the next the next uh, part of things here. So otherwise, all the triggered abilities that are waiting to get put on the stack go on the stack, and then the check is repeated. So this was this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, point here, um, but that's how triggered abilities fit into uh, all of this. So the the example that I have here is we're going to say that Amy plays the Eternal Witness, and while she's playing the Eternal Witness, she realizes, oh wait, Nick has this Elish Norn in play, <laughs> so maybe the Eternal Witness is uh, not the play that I wanted to do. So the question is, does Amy have the ability to return Eternal Witness to her hand using the triggered ability from Eternal Witness? Um, so that, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, Based on that rule that we just saw, or that the part of the rule that we just saw, the way that this is going to work is the following. First, the game does all the state-based actions. Then, the game checks to see if there's any triggered abilities that have triggered, and at, at that time, it puts them onto the stack. Um, and what that means is the target for Eternal Witness's triggered ability is going to get chosen after state-based actions have been performed. So therefore, what's going to happen is the Eternal Witness enters the battlefield, and that causes the triggered ability to trigger. Uh, but the triggered ability waits. It doesn't go on the stack right away. Then the game checks state-based actions, which means that Elish Norn making the Eternal Witness a zero negative one is going to result in the Eternal Witness being put into the graveyard. And then the triggered ability is going to get to go on the stack. And so that's pretty important because at the time when the triggered ability goes on the stack, that's when you choose the targets for the triggered ability. And so because Eternal Witness is indeed in our graveyard at the time when we're choosing targets for that triggered ability, we do indeed have the ability to return Eternal Witness to our hand with that triggered ability. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, and that that's that's the, the, the significance for that line there. Oop. So once no more state-based actions have been performed as a result of a check and no triggered abilities are waiting to be put on the stack, then the appropriate player gets priority. So I kind of spoilered the, the question that I uh, had in the wings here for, uh, for this here, but we're going to use Elish Norn again and we're going to use Sakura Tribe Elder. And the idea is, is it possible to play the Sakura Tribe Elder and then sacrifice it before Elish Norn uh, causes it to go to the graveyard. And so the answer to that question is contained in that last uh, bit of rules that we that we had there, um, which is that uh, once no more state-based actions have been performed, uh, then the appropriate player gets priority. So of course you would need priority in order to uh, activate an ability, but you do not get priority until after the game does state-based actions, at which point the Sakura Tribe Elder will be getting put into your graveyard. So it is not possible to play the Sakura Tribe Elder into an Elish Norn and then sacrifice it to get a land. Um, and uh, this process also occurs in the cleanup step, except that if no state-based actions are performed as a result of the, the step's first check and no triggered abilities are waiting to get put on the stack, uh, then no player gets priority in the step ends. So basically, the game the game does all that like song and dance about you know checking state-based actions and then checking to see if there's any triggered abilities. And then if, if we had any state-based actions, we have to repeat the check for state-based actions. It does all that stuff, except what we were talking about before, that the last slide, um, what usually happens at the end of that process is the person who's about to get priority actually does get priority. Uh, of course, in the cleanup step, the person who's about to get priority, uh, generally people don't get priority. So what, what would actually happen in this case is uh, then no player would get priority in the, the step ends. So, but uh, there is a state-based actions check during the cleanup step. But the, uh, uh, so, so that's the first like kind of interesting point about this rule. The second kind of interesting point about this rule is uh, it, it's only if no state-based actions were performed and no triggered abilities are waiting to get put on the stack uh, that we have this thing where no player gets priority in the step ends. Which means that if a state-based action does get performed during the cleanup step, or if a triggered ability does go on the stack during the cleanup step, then that means you would get priority uh, to, to uh, cast spells and activate abilities. And what would happen then is you'd get another cleanup step afterwards uh, where hopefully we would get no state-based actions and no triggered abilities so we would finally get to move on to the, the next 
uh, person's turn. So here's a, an example of that, because I know that's kind of like, you know, a little bit abstract and maybe uh, a, a little bit too wishy-washy for, for some people. So here, here's the example that, that we came up with here. So Nick plays a silence against Amy. Now, Amy is really sad because Amy had this really cool instant spell that she wanted to cast during her turn. Uh, but unfortunately, she can't because Nick played a silence. So that's really sad. Um, but Amy is super duper savvy and she knows a lot of tricks. And so she figures something out. The idea is we're going to crew the Iron Tread Crusher and then we're going to equip a Bone Splitter to it. And so why are we doing that? Well, let's remember uh, a couple of things. First of all, the crew says uh, that it becomes an artifact creature until end of turn, right? So the Iron Tread Crusher is going to stop being a creature at the end of turn, right? Now that's significant because uh, that is when the cleanup set, is, that's, that's when that wears off is in the cleanup set. And so the Bone Splitter is going to be attached to a, thing that is not a creature. And so we remember that that was a state-based action that would make the bone splitter fall off. So what good does that do us? Well, there's one more piece of the puzzle that we're gonna need uh, access to. And that's that's this this rule uh, here. Um, so we're, we're gonna pull out, uh, this, this is uh, a, not the state-based action part of the CR, but actually the, uh, uh, the part that talks about how the cleanup step works. So basically, there's three things that happen in the cleanup step. The first one is that you discard down to your maximum hand size. The next one is like a composite that has like a bunch of stuff happening in it. But for our purposes, the important thing is, is that until end of turn effects and this turn effects end during that, that second composite step. And then we've got the third thing. Uh, and so normally no one receives priority during the cleanup step. So no spells uh, can be cast and no abilities can be activated. However, we've got this exception, which is that uh, at this point, which again is after until end of turn and this turn effects have ended. So therefore, after the silence target opponent can't play spells this turn has worn off, uh, then the game checks to see if there's any state-based actions that could be performed. Uh, and there is in this case, because that's what we did. We equipped the vehicle with an equipment so that there would be a state-based action that would cause it to fall off. Um, if so, those state-based actions are performed and then the triggered abilities get put on the stack and then the active player gets priority. And so again, this is after the point where the silence has worn off. So the silence doesn't actually go to the very end of the turn. The silence actually goes until uh, the cleanup step, which is when this turn and until end of turn effects wear off. And usually that's pretty much good enough. Uh, but in fact, in this case, uh, due to Amy's clever machinations here, uh, it, is, it is not good <laughs> enough. Um, and so, uh, the there's nothing special about the vehicle or the equipment. That's just like probably the most accessible way that could come up in normal gameplay um, that uh, that a player would be able to cause state-based actions to happen during the cleanup step. And so if, if there was any other way uh, that was available to you, you could use that as well. Uh, and this trick would work just as well. Um, I think there's actually a card in standard that, that works kind of like silence. So that means that this, this trick could hypothetically come up in a standard game. And that would be kind of uh, cool and slash fun if, if I was the judge and I got to explain that to somebody, uh, why, why their opponent was able to cast a spell after they had gotten uh, silenced. Uh, so that, that's a uh, um, th th very, very exciting uh, example. So next, next up, uh, We've got this uh, other rule. So this is actually after uh, that big, long, gigantic block of text rule. This is a, a later one, but this is still important for, for understanding how state-based actions function. So I, I'm, I'm gonna put this in as, as like, you know, also the same kind of uh, idea. So if multiple state-based actions would have the same result at the same time, a single replacement effect uh, will replace all of them. And so for, for uh, this one here, this is kind of like the canonical example of, of this. Uh, you, you've got, uh, you know, two-two death touch creature, and it's uh, in combat with the two-two regenerate creature. So we're going to regenerate the horn troll, and we want the horn troll to live. But like, how many times would we have to regenerate the horn troll uh, to to get that to to work? So you know, you might think maybe once um, because it's getting destroyed uh, in combat, and maybe you would think twice because we we've got death touch that's destroying it, and then we have the the two damage and two toughness thing that's also destroying it. 
So, you know, it, it, it's kind of ambiguous whether we're, we're like destroying it once or destroying it twice uh, as far as the game is concerned. Uh, that rule there uh, that I just had on screen a while ago uh, indicates that we only need one uh, replacement effect. So we only would need to regenerate once in order to uh, survive this combat with the Daggerback Basilisk. And so that's uh, that's important. That's uh, an interesting one. Actually, more interesting is the the one that the comprehensive rules. They they actually have an example in the comprehensive rules for this uh, specific rule, uh, and it has to do with like someone losing the game twice, and then uh, uh, you know so they have Lich's mirror, I believe, um, that that was sufficient to re replace both of those losing the game instances. Uh, so that that's another uh, really kind of fun example. You can read that in the uh, comprehensive rules. Uh, if you're so inclined, but that's basically the crux. The crux of it is, is if you like sign in blood to double crown your opponent, uh, and they have the Lich's mirror out, then they can survive with just one Lich's mirror. So that's that's uh, also a fun example. So, and then there's this one here. So this is, <sighs> boy, this is one of my favorite. Well, okay, maybe maybe not, maybe not my like very favorite state based action rule, but it's it's very important uh, to know. Um, because, well, well, we'll read through it and, and I'll talk about it a little bit afterwards. So if a state-based action results in a permanent leaving the battlefield at the same time as other state-based actions were performed, then the last known information comes from the game state immediately before any of those state-based actions were performed. So if you're, you know, kind of lost as to what was going on there, here's a, a concrete example. And this is, this is like the kind of canonical example, uh, between for, for this one here. So we've got like the young wolf and the young wolf has a plus one, plus one counter on it. Uh, and then we're going to Splendid Agony, and obviously we're putting both the, the minus one counters on, on the, the Young Wolf. So what is uh, going to happen? Are we going to undie or not? And this, this is like the situation that made them have to come up with this rule. Uh, is when they printed Undying, they had to, they had to come up with something. Uh, actually, I think they uh, had to come up with something for Persist um, first. But like same, same kind of idea, right? So with this we have uh, you know, no real obvious answer as to whether the young wolf had or did not have a plus one plus one counter on it, right? Because if we remember from, if we remember from our uh, discussions earlier, the state-based actions all happen at once, right? They're, all of the state-based actions get written down in the list, and then every state-based action that's written on the list happens in one shot as part of the same game action. So the young wolf getting uh, put into the graveyard for having zero toughness and the young wolf losing its minus one, minus one counter and plus one, plus one counter is both happening as part of the same game event. And so what that means is that we really, it, it, it's really ambiguous as to whether the young wolf did or did not have the, the plus one, plus one counter on it. And so that, that's the reason why this rule exists is, is it specifically spells out what happens in that case. Um, so, uh, based on that, of course, the game state immediately before any state-based actions were performed, the young wolf did have a plus one, plus one counter on it. And so that means that the young wolf will not uh, have the undying active because it is considered to have had a plus one, plus one counter in this case. So, okay, uh, this is obviously not the most significant example of this. Uh, it's, it's probably like the first time where it came up, but it became extremely important to know how this worked uh, when we had like modular creatures and infect creatures in the same modern format. Uh, and so like there are definitely tier one modern decks that include both of those mechanics. So understanding exactly what happens if, if uh, there's a combat involving those two uh, types of mechanics uh, is, is uh, based on this rule here. And so this, this one uh, th this rule seems like it might not be like super impactful, but it, it, there actually are some very important cases where uh, where this one comes up. So uh, th that's that. And uh, now we're ready for some challenge questions. And uh, you, you know me, I love uh, putting in a couple of challenge questions to uh, help everybody test their understanding. So uh, first one here, we got Marrow here, and we're going to play the Wheel of Fortune. And the uh, obviously the, the question is, 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 does the Marrow live this or not? And so... Power and toughness is equal to the number of cards in your hand. So we remember what we said before uh, about how the state-based actions do not get checked all the time. Now, if this was a triggered ability that said when you have no cards in hand, then do something, that ability would trigger here from the Wheel of Fortune because there is a time during Wheel of Fortune resolving 
where you in fact have zero cards in your hand. However, that time is not any of the times when the game is checking state-based actions. And so what that means is the marrow will indeed live even though there was a very real time where your hand had zero cards in it. So that, that would mean that it would have zero toughness at that one specific instant. But because we don't get priority during the resolution of a spell, we also don't check state-based actions during the resolution of the spell. We only check state-based actions at the very end of the process after all of the instructions have been completed, including the part where we put the spell into its owner's graveyard. And so yes, you will live uh, with the marrow unless you had like zero cards where you uh, had in your library. Uh, so if, if your hand is zero cards after the Wheel of Fortune resolves, well, it's Sorry, Mero, but uh, also probably sorry you because you probably uh, have zero cards in your library. So that's that's going to be a challenge uh, all of its own. Uh, and you're going to be facing that challenge without Mero too. So that's super sad. Uh, next challenge question is, uh, this is one that I get kind of a lot, right? So the, the question is like, if we have Xenagos the Reveler and, and the other Xenagos in play, like what happens? And uh, the answer is a, a whole lot of reveling. And that's, that's the only thing that happens because um, these, these two clearly represent the same storyline character. So uh, if, if they're both legendary, which, you know, remember this one would also be legendary as a result of uh, changing. But, you know, they're both legendary, but they have different names. So they got different names. Legend rule don't care. Uh, so as a result, they, uh, there is absolutely no problem at all with having two storyline characters, two cards representing the same storyline character in play at the same time. Uh, you just got to make sure that their names are different. So if you, if you can manage that, we're, we're all good. So, all right. Ooh, yeah, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, obviously this was a way better question back before they banned Birthing Pod, uh, in Modern. Uh, but it's, it's still a fun question, even though it can't really come up in any, uh, you know, tier one decks at the moment. So the question is this, um, we've got the wall of roots and the wall of roots has like what, four, four counters on it. And we want to activate the birthing pod. Is it possible for us to sacrifice wall of roots as the, the creature that we're sacrificing and also, you know, put the last minus zero minus one counter on wall of roots to get the, the green mana. And so at first you might think, no, right? Um, well, certainly it doesn't seem like that's something that should work, but let's, let's think about how this would happen if we were going to activate an ability. So the way that activating an ability works is there's a, a, a set thing of steps that you have to go through. So we're going to go through all the different steps in order. And one of the steps is you get to activate mana abilities, which this is a mana ability. So you can generate mana to pay for activating the ability. And then one of the steps is the, the part where you pay all the costs. So you, you, you would activate this ability to make it green and then you would pay all the costs. So you, you could maybe use the green over here and then you could use the wall of roots over here. So the important thing to know is that we do not get priority in the middle of the process for activating an ability. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Because you wouldn't be you wouldn't want people to be able to like nest activating abilities inside each other. That sounds pretty uh, pretty thorny, and there's a lot of things that could go wrong there. So, because no player is getting priority during that process, that means that we're not checking state based actions any time in that process. And so that means that even though the Wall of Roots is a zero zero creature at the time when we're sacrificing it, it still is a creature and it's still in play. So you still would be able to uh, make that play. So you you would be able to uh, put the last minus zero minus one counter on wall of roots and also sacrifice it for birthing pod in order to activate birthing pod. So that's that was a, a really important interaction to know uh, back when this was a modern deck. Uh, now, maybe not as much, but it's still fun to think about. And okay, speaking of fun to think about uh, interactions, we've got this one here. This is this is a spirit token. You know, you, you get these anywhere. Um, Lots of stuff makes spirit tokens nowadays. So we're going to cloud shift the spirit token and what happens. And if you think about this question and we're only thinking about stuff that we know from listening to me talk for the last like 45 minutes, you should have said that the answer was, yeah, it comes back no problem, right? Because it's, it's just like what we were talking about before. No player gets priority in the process of cloud shift resolving. Right, so there's there's no one getting priority in between the exiling the spirit token and the returning the spirit token to the battlefield. However, uh, you know, usually you would mean that that uh, you, usually that would mean that the spirit token should come back okay, right? Because 
Uh, it is true that tokens vanish if, if they're uh, in, in a zone that's not the battlefield, but as long as we come back to the battlefield before the state-based actions get checked, then we should be okay, right? And, you know, that's true, but then the fun police come in. So a token that has left the battlefield cannot move to another zone or come back onto the battlefield. Uh, so if such a token would change zones, it remains in its current zone. And then it ceases to exist the next time state-based actions are checked. So that's the fun police right there. So what's actually going to happen is the cloud shift is going to exile the spirit token just fine. Then this cloud shift is going to try to return the spirit token to the battlefield, but it can't because of this rule. So nothing's going to happen. And then the cloud shift is going to get put into its owner's graveyard because all of its instructions are done. And then the game is going to check state-based actions and it's going to see that there's a token in the exile zone and then the token vanishes. So that's how that one would actually work. A little bit of a bummer. Um, very, very sad, but uh, that's, that's the breaks. And this one... Whew, Boy, I gotta say, this is this is one of my favorites. Uh, this this is a question that I wrote myself, um, and I, I wrote it when when the the Ether Revolt came out. So uh, a lot of people actually had this question on their minds. So I don't know if I feel uh, right taking credit for it, but this is a, a new rule that we needed to to come up with this. So the question is this: obviously, like uh, Amy is gonna play the Hurricane for five. Uh, you know, Nick's at five life, and he has an exquisite Archangel. What happens? So obviously Nick's not going to lose the game, right? Because if you would lose the game, then we, we exile the exquisite archangel and your life total becomes 20. The, the interesting part about this uh, is what happens to the exquisite archangel, um, right? Because it, it's a flying creature, so it, it took five damage from the hurricane. Um, but at the same time, uh, the replacement effect here says that we want to exile it. And that's, that's kind of weird. So, you know, are, are we exiling it? Or are we putting it in the graveyard? What do we do? So... At times like this, it's, it's best to like think through exactly what's happening exactly officially uh, uh, in the game. So what we're going to do is the, the hurricane is going to resolve, right? So we've got five damage here, we got five damage on Nick, and then the hurricane goes to the graveyard. Okay, now we're going to do state-based actions, and state-based actions, uh, we're, we're going to go on, we're, we're going to make our list of state-based actions, and, and let's see, we, I see one state-based action where Nick loses, and I see two state-based actions where the exquisite archangel goes to the graveyard. Okay, okay. So now uh, we, we see, oh, if you would lose the game, instead you exile the archangel. So now we've got one state-based action where we exile exquisite archangel and your life total becomes 20, and one where we destroy exquisite archangel. And remember what we said, the state-based actions all happen at the same time, right? So both of those two things are supposed to be happening at the same time. But of course, it doesn't make any sense to destroy something and exile something at the same time. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to like pull a, a King Solomon here and like cut the exquisite archangel in half and like exile half and put the other half in the graveyard. Uh, so what we what we actually do is, is this rule here. Um, if an effect would move, uh, if an object would move from one zone to another, determine what event is moving the object and then apply any appropriate replacement effects. So, you know, like what we had with the Archangel. And if anything tries to do two or more contradictory or mutually exclusive things to a particular object, that object's controller or its owner. Uh, if there is no controller, they, they choose what effect to apply. So that's the uh, answer to our question. Probably the most fair uh, answer, the most intuitive answer. Uh, Amy is the, the person uh, who's who's doing the damage? So maybe you could make an argument for maybe Amy would get to to say where it should go. But Nick is the the object's controller, and so therefore Nick chooses uh, which fate uh, awaits his exquisite archangel, whether it goes to the graveyard or the exile zone. And so that that is the answer to that question. Uh, and that's that's all the questions that I had uh, prepared for today. So uh, for, once again, huge thanks to all of my patrons. I appreciate all of you so much, and I made this video especially for you, and hopefully all of you liked it, uh, whether you're a patron or not, or whether you're a judge or not, or whether you're somebody who's interested in state-based actions and is a giant rules fanboy. So that is all I have for you today. Uh, how did you do? Join me again next time for another Daily Ruling, but until then, I hope you have a great day.